pleasure to be here. I am also taking up the question of happiness. The pursuit of the good life is lasting happiness really possible. So we, you might think of the Declaration of Independence. Our own nation proposes to us that our country was founded uh, to secure life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all of us. And that's something very common to our understanding of ourselves as a nation. But we might ask, well, what is happiness? Father Brent was speaking about that already. What is the best and happiest life that a human being can live? Or what kind of life ought I to be striving for or aiming at? And I would submit, as I think probably many of you would agree, and certainly Father Brent, that these are some of the most important questions a person can ask. They're classic philosophical questions, but they're questions that are not only for philosophers, because in fact, no one is exempt from asking them. And they touch every person, every life. So in a sense, the answer that you give to that question, to the extent that, that you reflect on it, and I think many people reflect on it only in a kind of imperfect way or kind of uh, vague, vague way, but it is possible to reflect on it in a more explicit way, and that's part of what I'm trying to take up here. The answer that you give to that kind of question will shed light on every action in your life, inasmuch as every action has a goal or an aim in mind. So my goal in this talk is to go a little deeper on this subject, taking especially uh, my cues from one of the greats of the Western philosophical tradition, that is St. Thomas Aquinas. So no surprise to you there, perhaps. Um, so let me just start by uh, outlining just a few principles. And Father Brent has already covered some of this material, so I'm really just going to uh, give you a few bullet points, uh, as it were, framing it maybe in just slightly different terms than he did, but basically the same picture from Thomas Aquinas on the issue of happiness. So um, at first, some of these ideas may not seem immediately obvious how they connect to the issue of the search for happiness. Uh, but in fact, I would say they're very important for setting us off on the right path. So uh, Aquinas begins with something that is a, a kind of centerpiece for his whole account, which is that the human being is made in the image of God. And that part of what this means for Aquinas is that we are creatures with reason and will. So you heard that from Father Brent. So in other words, the image of God for Aquinas is not a physical resemblance to God. I mean, you don't have like God's nose or chin, right? Um, God in his divinity does not have a body. So if God is a pure spirit and you are in his image, what does that imply about you? Well, it, it's not a physical likeness. It's a spiritual likeness or a spiritual capacity that in some way shares in what is most typically found in God. And Aquinas says that this consists in our capacity to understand and to love, or reason and will, intellect and will. On a very concrete level then, this means that when we act, we act, or at least we usually act, with reasons. So that's the most typical characteristic of a properly human action. Now, of course, we sometimes engage in actions that we don't deliberate about or actions that don't have a good reason. And sometimes we act positively irrationally, but that's not when we are being most human. I mean, you can, you can say about one of your friends, you know, like, you partied like an animal last night. Um, and maybe you mean that as a compliment, but <laughs> Maybe it's not really that good of a compliment uh, because, yes, we are animals, but we are rational animals, and that means we are animals who should act with reasons. And one of the things that happens when you get really, really drunk is that you have very bad reasons, and you will wake up the next day and you'll be like, that was a terrible idea. And, and you, you know, I mean, you notice the kind of self-evaluation that's happening there when you see that your reason was impaired and you did something that when you were thinking clearly you never would have done that. And that's an indication that that's not 
when you're acting your best. It's when you're acting in a kind of less than fully human way, which is a good reason not to get uh, you know, as drunk as a perfect party animal or something like that. OK, but, but more than, than just speaking about individual actions, we are the kinds of creatures that have purposeful individual actions, but in fact, whole schemes of acting, right? Extensive plans. We aim at more distant goals. We can nest goals within goals. And that's actually very characteristic of human behavior. So think about uh, yourself, for those of you who are uh, here studying for an academic degree at Yale, you have embarked in a rather sophisticated scheme of activity to obtain that academic degree. But that is going to have lots of subordinate activities nested within it that you're going to have to plan for and maybe even discipline yourself about. So that implies getting up in the morning to go to your class because you know if you don't pass this class, you're never going to get your degree and so forth. But then again, getting your degree may be nested within a larger scheme of goals, uh, accomplishing a larger set of goals for your career, for example. But we can keep pushing the perspective wider and ask, well, OK, what's the next scheme that that fits into? And that's exactly the kind of analysis that St. Thomas Aquinas uh, and others, of course, Aristotle among them, suggest that we should be doing when we raise the question of happiness. Now, in the 20th century, there was a much debated philosophical question. Is there what is called one dominant or all-encompassing end or aim to human life? Alistair McIntyre has called this a unitary but complex theory of the good. Or does happiness result from attaining a kind of basket of goods, multiple and diverse goods, so that you always have to have a kind of mixture in this basket. So a certain amount of wealth, a certain amount of friendship, a certain amount of honor, a certain amount of pleasure, and so forth. Uh, so we'll be talking about that. I just wanted to flag that at the beginning. But uh, let's stay with Aquinas for a minute here. Aquinas does think that there is one dominant, all-encompassing end to life. And that if you want to answer the question, what is happiness, you need to give some thought to what that end is. But it's helpful to clarify what he means by that, because there's very typical contemporary confusions when you ask this question. Because what Aquinas means by talking about one ultimate end for human life is not whether there is one good that is so good that you stop caring about all the other goods, as if it pushed out of the picture all the other goods. He's rather talking about a good that in a certain way englobes, encompasses, and includes all the others, so that you can understand them in a kind of ordered hierarchy that has a kind of uh, all-encompassing good at the top. So actually, to connect with what we heard from Father James Brent uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, the point of connection here, he was talking about the teleological structure of reality, that we find a kind of goal-directedness, not only in human beings, but also in all kinds of natural kinds. And you, you could even say that you, know, you find it in inanimate things, not that they have an intention to act for an end, but they do sort of in a very uh, ordered and consistent way, behave with a kind of directedness. There's a kind of direction. So you could even say, like contemporary astronomers studying star formation or a planet formation would say, uh, well, you know, cosmic dust has a kind of tendency, an inclination to, to coalesce and form planets. Uh, that's kind of interesting. And Aquinas understood that as a kind of uh, inclination or goal-directedness in inanimate nature. But he certainly thinks that animate nature displays those tendencies. Bees and spiders behave in ordered patterns, uh, which seem to be kind of intelligible to us. And also human beings, but in a higher way. So sort of that's uh, what we're talking about. 
insofar as we have a common nature, a common human nature, Aquinas thinks that the end of that nature is going to also be the same for us all. And I think Father Brent was talking about that. So insofar as we are all natural beings of the same kind, we have a certain directedness or pattern, ordering of our life, and our flourishing or our happiness will, in fact, look the same, or will have the same structure. It's not to say that everyone has to have the same career plan, far from it, but that the basic picture, and in fact, the ultimate end, will be the same for us all. Okay, now maybe that sounds like a very controversial claim, but let's uh, um, speak a little bit more about this. I think the best way to think about this kind of all-encompassing aim or final end, as Aquinas talks about it, is just to think about our own activity as, a, as we've already started to do. You act for a reason, typically. Our human act, actions are motivated by purposes or aims or ends, which are in a certain way the cause of our actions, like you did it because you were seeking some goal, and in fact, human beings typically become rather frustrated and unhappy when they don't have a sense of purpose. So this is a kind of basic feature, I think, of our, of our natural kind. So Aquinas, in Aquinas' mind, this, this kind of end-directed activity is tied to at least three things. Maybe I'm giving different enumerations of them than, than Father Brent, but let me just cover this very quickly. The first is Aquinas' philosophy of human action as motivated by the good. So everyone seeks what he or she perceives as good. And that's kind of a definitional thing. We'll talk more, more about that in, in just a second, just very briefly because Father Brent has already covered a lot of that. The second point is Aquinas' idea of happiness as something that will be sufficient for us. In fact, perfectly sufficient. So we want, if we're going to try to identify what will make us happy, it needs to be something that will satisfy us and satisfy us uh, perfectly. Now, on this point, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time and throw out some, some objections and try and reply to them. And then there's a third point about this kind of final end or way of thinking about happiness with respect to having a final end. And this really moves us into the realm of theology, although it's uh, something we can begin to apprehend simply through philosophy, as Father Brent did a very nice job at the end of his talk. The possibility of communion with God, knowing God, contemplating God, perhaps even sharing in his life. Okay, so that's uh, maybe a rather radical thing to talk about, but a very important one from the perspective of Aquinas. Okay, so let's go back to, this, to the first point. So I'm going to just go through basically these three points uh, in connection with this seeking the end. So human action is motivated by a good, at least always a perceived good. I'm just going to say a few words about that. For Aquinas, everyone desires the good. And there is a kind of universal inclination to the good. And he even makes the point, which Father Brent was talking about, that even animals, plants, even inanimate matter like cosmic dust has a kind of inclination towards some good for it. Now, we could immediately start with a problem of definition here because often modern people think of something very different when we say the word good than Aquinas is probably trying to point us to. So often a modern uh, hearer of this word will think that good designates what conforms to some kind of moral law or precept, some kind of commandment, like it's good if you obey the law, and if you break the law, then it's bad. But actually, this is not what Aquinas means when he is talking about every one is desiring the good, because obviously some people desire to break the law. Um, rather, what Aquinas is talking about is something deeper, that we are desiring something that is perfective and something that fulfills our appetites or our natural inclinations. 
Okay, so what do we then mean when we say this word good? This is a deep philosophical subject. We could have a whole conference just on this. I'm just going to give you two very, very brief um, points. Aquinas doesn't actually try to define the good because he saw it as a primary notion. And he says, you cannot define uh, those kinds of prime realities. You know them from their effects. Um, and so what is the effect of the good? We reach out for it. We, we desire it. We have an appetite for it. So you can define the good simply as what is desirable or what all desire. So the good is what we desire, or we could even say what arouses our desire and our love, or what we are desiring in all of our acts of willing. Uh, now this has an interesting corollary, which I'm just going to mention and then move on. Uh, for Aquinas, this, this helps us see the place of freedom in our moral actions. Freedom is not just opposed to morality, as if like morality is about laws that we're then supposed to obey and so constrain our freedom and make us feel weighed down. No, actually, morality is about seeking the good. And the good is what we desire. So our nature is built to desire certain things. And our freedom actually arises from this, you might say, aboriginal thirst or desire for the good. Because the freedom is the way our intellect engages in the search for the good. Your will is a rational appetite, according to Aquinas. OK, so freedom has to do with how we, as intellectual, rational creatures, seek the good. We, we do it in a different way than spiders or bees or dogs or lions do it. We do it because we understand our goal and then order and choose our actions to attain a goal. OK, there's a second way of describing a good, equally important to this first one. The first one, the good is what we desire. The second way that Aquinas uses is to say, the good is what perfects a being. So the good is perfective. And here, again, we see a connection to the kind of thing you are. So Aquinas thinks there is a, an objective good for a human creature because of the kind of creature that a human being is. All right, but I'm going to move on very quickly past this because this is a lot of the terrain covered in Father Brent's talk. And move now to my second overarching point, which is about uh, what is happiness? So what is happiness when Aquinas talks about that? And he has a lot to say about this. Um, and here he's inheriting a long philosophical tradition, and we have some real experts seated in the front row about this, so I have to be careful. I have to mind my P's and Q's here. Uh, Adam Eitel, Candace Vogler um, are, are much more expert on this kind of thing. But I'm going to give you just a kind of quick summary of Aquinas's account of a kind of general idea of happiness and also the possibility of imperfect happiness. So maybe we could talk about the second idea first, imperfect happiness, or you might say relative happiness. Um, happiness in a certain respect. So perhaps you're familiar with these kinds of statements. I'm happy in this job. More or less, you know, I'm happy in this job. I have a happy marriage. I'm happy at Yale. Is this expressing uh, that you have everything that you could possibly want or desire? or that you've reached the end of your search for goods? No, um, you could actually ask someone who says, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy in my job. You could say, oh, are you perfectly happy? That is, is there anything in your life that could improve? And the answer to this will almost always be, oh, yes, of course, you know, yes, I can think of things that would be better. Aquinas uses this kind of reasoning to show that we have some sense of and in fact, a deep desire of, or desire for, a greater happiness than what we typically experience in our day-to-day -day lives. So we experience all kinds of things that are really good, having a good job, having a happy marriage, having good friends, getting a good education, being honored, being 
uh, wealthy or something like that. Those are all uh, good in a, in a partial way, but they don't quell all of our desires. And it seems that we can always formulate some deeper thirst that no amount of those things will satisfy. Now, you might think at this point, well, actually, this maybe is a false question, a false quest. Maybe it's simply impossible to fully be satisfied. Maybe all we can ever hope for is some kind of imperfect happiness. So therefore, uh, it would be useless to try and pursue this kind of uh, quest, uh, which is really just tilting it at windmills. Um, and I think Aquinas might say that if your horizon is only in this world, only in this life, and certainly if your horizon is only in the domain of my career, my friends, my wealth, my pleasures, then perfect happiness is impossible. But Aquinas does think that there is another possibility, a greater possibility, a possibility that actually can give us a full measure of happiness, a true and perfect and lasting satisfaction of our desires. Okay, Father Brent has already kind of advertised where we're going with this. But it might be helpful for us to go through what Aquinas says about specific possibilities, specific candidates for happiness. And Aquinas, following a, a, a venerable philosophical tradition, goes through a list of goods that can give us some partial satisfaction, but only partial. So the classical candidates for what will make you happy. And when I've taught this material in the classroom, um, I've always found students get very interested in this because um, usually we kind of uncritically include these things in our own picture of happiness. But it's helpful to like philosophically critique whether these, this really good idea to make our life aiming at, at these things. So the first we might say is wealth. There are a very large number of people who kind of uncritically assume that more wealth will make them happier and maybe even organize their lives around acquiring wealth. There are a lot of people you can find uh, who do that. Maybe you, maybe you know some of them even. Here Aquinas distinguishes between two kinds of wealth. Artificial wealth, money, and natural wealth, things that you can use. And he says, well, artificial wealth cannot be ultimately what you're seeking, like dollar bills, because they only are good for you insofar as they can get you something else. So dollar bills are not what you're pursuing because of themselves, dollar bills are not very useful. They're only useful if you can get something else with them. And of course, if the, if the US government changed the currency tomorrow and said all of the dollar bills you have in your wallet or all of the dollars that you have in your bank account are no longer valuable and now we're switching to some other, some other measure of wealth, like you wouldn't try to be getting those dollar bills anymore. Um, so artificial wealth is only for the sake of other things. Natural wealth, perhaps. Okay, natural wealth, think here like a house or a car or an iPhone or food and things like that. Well, is that the ultimate end of human life, to have this kind of natural wealth? Well, natural wealth is important. It supports our bodily existence. And so, in a way, we can't do without some of it, for sure. But isn't it also true that there's only so much of it that you can have and enjoy? And it's finite, it's passing, it's very limited. So once you've got a sufficient quantity of natural wealth, like one more, if you, if you have like 25 islands in the Caribbean, like one more island in the Caribbean might not actually help you very much. It becomes less, and certainly when you get to the, the thousandth Caribbean island, like you're, you're really not helped by having more of that. More iPhones, when you've already got a warehouse of them, is not really desirable for you. <laughs>
I mean, even if you had one that you used, you know, you're going to use a different one every day. Um, it just, well, actually, that would probably be a real disadvantage if you had to keep changing your phone number. But um, <laughs> it, it's, it becomes a real problem uh, to have too much of this natural wealth. What do you do with it? Curiously, Aquinas uh, notes, along with, with others, that it seems that we have the capacity to have a kind of endless desire for artificial wealth, uh, but not an endless desire for natural wealth. So that's kind of curious. So that, like, you, you wouldn't actually try to get 100,000 iPhones, but you might try to get enough money to buy 100,000 iPhones, even though you will never actually use all that money. And that's, that's strange. OK, what about other candidates? Uh, honor or fame? Aquinas' critique here uh, is very simple. We can state it very quickly. For the sake of, um, y you want to be praised for the sake of some excellence in you. Like if all of a sudden I called one of you up and gave you uh, this you know, very important award, but you knew you had done absolutely nothing to deserve it, even if we all applauded you, how important or good would you really feel about having gotten that reward? Or, or uh, think about it this way, how many veterans would proudly wear a, a decoration that they knew they didn't deserve? It's like stuff of a movie or of a, or of a novel, like a guy gets mistaken for his buddy who's killed, and he gets the Congressional Medal of Honor, even though he didn't do anything courageous at all. Maybe he ran away. And then for the rest of, the life, the rest of his life, he's, he's feted as the hero of this military action. And what, what kind of psychological effect does that have on the man? Well, it might actually lead him to all kinds of terrible complexes of guilt. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make him happy to be honored for something that he knows he doesn't deserve. So Aquinas says honor and fame operates this way. Actually, you, you, you want to be famous, you want to be honored because of some excellence, not without that excellence. And so really what you should pursue is the excellence, not the honor or the fame itself. What about power? Well, what is power? It makes you able to do something. But uh, is that just a good of itself to be able to do something but not yet be doing it? A uh, power, in other words, is a means. It's a, an important means, perhaps, but it's a means to do something. And don't you actually want to use the power? That's the point. So power is a means, not an end. But actually, what we're looking for is the goal. Like, what is your goal? If you just say, well, to acquire power, well, just for the sake of having power, you, you've never really answered the question what you're actually trying to aim at. So power to do what? And in fact, uh, we know that uh, power can be used also for evil, and often the powerful are unhappy, paradoxically. Uh, so are famous people, often. Um, that's kind of also curious. OK, the last uh, candidate that I will uh, talk about here is a pleasure. Now, Aquinas thinks that this hits closer to the mark. That might surprise you. Uh, he thinks, and Aristotle also, thinks that pleasure is actually a really important category for our reflection on happiness. So getting a right understanding of pleasure in relation to happiness is extremely important because how you experience pleasure or the things in which you take pleasure actually has a lot to do with virtue and with how good you are, Aquinas thinks. So he would even say in a certain way it's a measure of your moral goodness or of your virtue. And that might not be a welcome um, thing for the party animal, you know, if you principally seek uh, being absolutely blotto drunk, um, you know, if that's what you really take pleasure in. It's not a very noble thing. But Aquinas actually says this, this helps you get some clarity on what really is your, uh, you know, the, the moral maturity that you have reached. According to Aristotle, being rightly trained to take pleasure in the right things and not in the wrong things is the essence of the moral life. Okay, so 
What are some wrong views of pleasure? I'll just very quickly review these. This is perhaps very basic. Uh, there's a utilitarian view that thinks that all pleasures are essentially the same or can be reduced to some univocal common denominator, like pleasure units, you know. Economists uh, will sometimes speak of utils or something like that, which, if wrongly understood, uh, could be, you know, used in this kind of utilitarian way. Uh, Aquinas does not think, and Aristotle does not think, that all pleasures are essentially the same or can be reduced in this way. He thinks that that's reductive. Okay, but that's, that's one, one view. There's a hedonist view of pleasure, uh, which would say something like, well, you know, in the end, all there is is pleasure. So uh, you should just seek to maximize your own pleasure and minimize your pain. Um, Aquinas would identify this with the, the ancient philosophical uh, school of uh, Epicurus, or the Epicureans. Um, generally, this kind of view is coupled with a materialist view of the world so that the only real pleasures are like sensory pleasures. Pleasure is being reduced to bodily sensation. Um, there's other objections that can be brought to bear uh, against this. Um, now, another uh, school of thought, uh, actually antedating Aquinas, Stoics thought that pleasures were evil. And uh, we also encounter, famously here at Yale, uh, at least in terms of Yale's own religious history, a Calvinist view that's very skeptical about pleasure, worried that pleasure is perhaps morally bad, uh, or at least suspect. And you might even think that Immanuel Kant would lead you a bit in this direction, insofar as he thinks pleasure, taking pleasure in an act might diminish its moral value. So insofar as you enjoy an act, you're not doing it simply to satisfy your duty. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, just giving a very, very rough sketch of these views, of course, which are much more complicated and have more to be said in their favor. Um, but I think it's helpful to just sort of uh, outline that. What does Aquinas think is the right way to think about pleasure? He says, actually, pleasure should be thought of in terms of a pleasure of what kind of thing you are doing. In other words, pleasure is not itself a thing. Pleasure is the flowering of a certain activity done well. It's like a rose blooming. So it's not a thing that you can aim at directly. It's a good activity done well. A good activity that attains to a good end. And the result of doing that is pleasure. So if he's right about this, then pleasure is not a single thing, like the utilitarians would say. It can't be reduced to like utils or something like that in a kind of monistic or reductive way. And it can't even really be aimed at directly apart from the activity that you're doing. Because it's not itself the goal or the end or the object of what you're pursuing, it's that you're doing that thing well. And then it becomes pleasant. So even to just reach this level of clarity about pleasure, I think, is very useful. That what should you aim at if you want to, like even hedonists get this wrong, like they aim at pleasure, and so they just try to have more of that pleasure, more of that pleasure, more of that uh, physical stimulus, more of that physical stimulus, and after a while what happens, it becomes less and less effective, right? You have to have more and more of the stimulus in order to get the same uh, result because they're aiming at the wrong thing. They should be aiming at doing the activity well and then the pleasure comes as a kind of a crowning of that good activity. So Aquinas would say that pleasure, like goodness, is analogical. It's an analogical notion, which means it's not just all the same, but it, it's a word and it's an idea that applies to different things in different ways, but with a kind of proportion between them or a, a, an order of analogy between them. So there is a pleasure of eating a chocolate bar. There is a pleasure of a hot bath. These are not the same. They're not reducible to each other. There's the pleasure of a good meal eaten with friends. 
there's the pleasure of a glass of wine. There are, I mean, you might immediately be thinking of sexual pleasure. That needs to be done well and in the right way if it's going to be most pleasant, actually. So a, a Thomist would say, like having a right understanding of human sexuality and putting it in the context of a, a permanent and committed relationship of marriage is the right way that will make it more pleasurable. Uh, that's something you don't often think, you know, or hear, uh, but I, that is Aquinas's view. There are likewise pleasures of, for example, doing a sport well. So if you run well or you play tennis well, there's a certain pleasure that you take in that, which is irreducibly different from the kind of pleasure you get from eating a good meal. There's a pleasure of winning at tennis as well, not just playing well, but winning. There's a pleasure of reading a good book or watching a good movie or studying something and understanding it. Do you, Remember the feeling that you had as a kid in math class when you finally got it and you have a kind of self-satisfaction that that happened? These are all irreducibly different pleasures. Uh, there can even be a pleasure in ironing your clothes. You know, I learned this when I got the Dominican habit, which sometimes requires ironing. It's like, you know, there's lots of things in my life that I cannot control, but I can make sure that this habit is well ironed. You know, there's a kind of pleasure that you can take in that. Maybe you don't take pleasure in it, but I, I sometimes do. And there are spiritual pleasures. I've already sort of talked about a few of them in a kind of a brief way. There's the pleasure of teaching someone, the pleasure of giving a gift to another that they really like, the pleasure of helping someone in need. Okay, those are not material pleasures. They're not sensory pleasures, but they're pleasures that actually can be much more valuable than sensory pleasures. And then there are pleasures that are proper to the spiritual or supernatural life. And these are pleasures that are harder for us to envision if you haven't already experienced them, a point I'm going to come back to. There is a pleasure to knowing God, a pleasure to loving him, a pleasure to praising him and giving your life to him. Now, that's a very refined and high pleasure, but Aquinas is not the kind of philosopher or theologian who is suspicious of those pleasures. And you see, now we are starting to see that those things are really good for us, and when you seek the good in the right way, it is very pleasant. So that's why pleasure is actually a tricky category. Many people will say that they're, that they're seeking pleasure, and in a certain sense, it's not so wrong to seek pleasure. It's actually better to seek pleasure in a certain way than to seek wealth. But pleasure in itself should not be the end. Why? Because it is just the crowning of seeking the goal in the right way. So this means we have not yet found the ultimate uh, aim of our study here, of our inquiry. Is there some all-encompassing uh, aim of human life? And the answer can't be just pleasure the answer, answer has to be something deeper, and I'll try to get there very quickly, but let me cover a quick, uh, two quick objections here. One objection uh, we've already seen, or I've already mentioned it, the basket of goods theory. Maybe, actually, what we just need is not just one pleasure, but maybe we need a kind of mixture of things like a certain amount of pleasure, a certain amount of wealth, a certain amount of uh, friends, a certain amount of power, and so forth. I think you can give a series of uh, answers to this objection from the classical tradition. One answer might be the Augustinian answer. So think of St. Augustine. Um, these, all these things are, are time bound. They're all in time. They're all only going to be temporary. And we have a kind of thirst for something that is not temporary. So maybe that is indicative to us uh, that the basket is not going to be good enough. But let me uh, then move quickly to another um, objection. You find this in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics in Book 1, and he puts it on the lips of Solon. Solon says, Call no man happy while he lives. You must see his end. Uh, what does he mean by that? Well, uh, you know, it might look like everything's working out for Jeffrey Epstein, uh, but uh, no, no, I don't think so, right? Okay, so uh, 
at a certain moment in time, it might look like a certain pattern of activity that is actually profoundly wicked is working out. But when you see the end, you're now able to judge that it didn't really work out. It was only apparent for a little while. But it might not even happen that way for someone who's wicked. It might be that um, someone seems to be doing very well and is not intrinsically wicked, and it still doesn't work out. Uh, well, maybe a less dramatic example than, than Jeffrey Epstein, Jay Gatsby in The Great Gatsby. Uh, if you haven't read the book, I won't give away the ending. Somebody did that to me in my freshman year of college, and I still am struggling with forgiveness about that. Suffice it to say, The Great Gatsby is not a story that ends happily and they all lived happily ever after, right? Okay, it's actually, isn't that kind of interesting that we, we have that kind of standard ending to children's stories? Um, uh, if the stock market crashes and you have a lot of wealth in the stock market, then overnight it might seem like maybe this uh, plan of life was not such a good idea and it didn't end well. Okay, so that's a kind of central problem to the basket of goods view. Um, they're all like very tenuous and we can be quite vulnerable. But you know what, Aristotle doesn't even think that it's the main problem with this position. Um, consider this uh, objection or consider this problem which he, which he articulates in the ethics. Even if a man has lived happily up to old age and has had a death worthy of his life, Many reverses may befall his descendants. Some of them may be good and attain the life they deserve, while with others, the opposite may be the case. And clearly, too, the degrees of relationship between them and their ancestors may vary indefinitely. It would be odd if the dead man were to share in these changes and become at one time happy, at another time wretched, based on like how it turned out for his children. And actually, we do care deeply about how things turn out for our children. So that's kind of uh, unstable, you know, if you think that the basket of goods theory is going to work for you because it's, in, it's of itself always going to be mutable and vulnerable and susceptible to loss, even after you die in a certain sense. History could judge you that you were on the wrong side of history. A more metaphysical critique of all of this, I think Aquinas would offer and say, all of this is finite and we want the infinite. Or, as St. Thomas often says, we want something that perfectly quells our appetite. So only that can be the ultimate candidate for real happiness. The question is, is there such a thing? Okay, let me just throw in one more brief objection, and it's the problem of original sin or the fall. Now here we're stepping into the realm, clearly, of theology. But according to the classic Christian understanding, uh, we all have inherited a human nature which is afflicted or defective in a certain way. We've inherited a kind of effect of something that has gone wrong before we were even born. So we are afflicted by the two great uh, afflictions of original sin, ignorance about what is really good. So we might want the good, but we don't know where to find it. And we find it very difficult to figure it out and concupiscence, especially disordered concupiscence, what is that? A wrong desiring of pleasure. We have a very, very hard time putting our pleasures in right order. We want to desire them out of order, not according to reason. And everyone probably has had the experience of saying, I should never have eaten that second piece of cake. You know, That's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about disordered concupiscence. Your mind is telling you, you probably shouldn't eat that, but your body is telling you that you want it, and you, you give in to that, uh, and we, we all struggle to, to master that in that area and in many others. So due to the wounds of original sin, we're in an even more difficult quandary than a purely philosophical account might suggest. That is, we have an inclination towards the good. We have a desire for some perfect good which would quell our appetite perfectly. But we don't know what that is because of the problem of ignorance, or at least it's not immediately obvious to us what that is. And 
we have all kinds of desires that we know are actually going to lead us in the wrong direction. Uh, but we have a very hard time resisting them. This is why Aquinas says, in the end, the search for happiness requires grace. Now, okay, I'm stepping fully into the realm of theology now. <laughs> it's not only natural virtue that we need to acquire, but also God's help to show us what we ought to be pursuing, to show us, in fact, that it's really possible to have, in a way that surpassed Aristotle's imagination, the kind of goal of contemplating God that Father Brent was talking about. Not only is it possible to know God as the source of being, the author of the universe, or the cause of all that is, it's actually possible to know him as your father, to know him as your friend. It's possible to be invited into his life and to share, in a way, in his unsurpassable life and love and joy and peace. And you might be saying that sounds like a very tall order. It is not naturally possible for us to attain to that. But because God reaches down to us and bestows this gift on us, it actually is possible to us through grace. So this is ultimately the answer that Aquinas gives about how to seek happiness. We can seek it in a certain way according to philosophy, but if we really want to get there, if we really want to get to the all-encompassing aim, something that will really satisfy us, that will satisfy us in the deepest possible way such that there will be nothing left to desire, there can be only one good that can satisfy us like that. That good must be infinite and perfect, and therefore it is only God. And in fact, we are made for this as intellectual creatures, rational creatures, because we are made to know and to love and the full perfection of that image of God in us, which we started with at the beginning of the talk, the full perfection of that image is that we would know and love God and actually know and love him as perfectly as it is possible for a creature to do, uh, which God grants us in what Aquinas calls the beatific vision, the loving vision of God himself. Let me uh, end with um, just two final very brief points about the difference between our appetite for material things and for spiritual things. Because um, when I read this in Aquinas, it, uh, I, I found it to be a tremendous revelation and really helped me a lot. It's a, I think it's a very simple but deep insight that, that can give some help to many people in thinking about uh, what our, our desires are for. Uh, think about it this way. When you are hungry, what are you desiring? Well, food, right? Your body needs food. When you're thirsty, you're desiring something to drink because your body needs uh, hydration at, at base. Okay, when you've had enough to eat, are you still hungry? No, you stop being hungry. At a certain point, if you're forced to continue eating, food becomes positively repulsive to you and it will make you sick. Now, isn't that curious? Our appetite for material things is an appetite for what we do not have but need. And then when we have them, we don't desire them anymore. So our appetite for material things works that way. You desire what you don't have, and when you get it, you don't desire it anymore. But your appetite for spiritual things, Aquinas says, is the opposite. And that's what's so interesting. When you don't have it, you don't desire it because you don't even perceive it as a possibility for you. So when you don't think that it's possible to have some knowledge of God or some communion or friendship with him or to share in his life or in the peace that he offers, you don't even desire it. And you begin to desire it when he begins to give it to you. So that grace is the beginning of the spiritual life and of a supernatural life. And as you obtain those spiritual goods, your desire for them increases. This means that in heaven, in a certain way, you will love God the most as is possible as you possess him the most perfectly. It's the opposite of the way you love food. You do not love the pizza after you've eaten an entire pizza. Uh, 
Uh, but you do love God when you have God perfectly. So uh, let me just conclude with a kind of um, statement uh, from Aquinas. Uh, there is a, an end to human life. It's an end that corresponds to our nature. And as you seek what human beings are made for, and ultimately they are made for God, you will find more and more happiness. But we might also put this in a much more personal and direct way, which is to say that God also desires, he loves, and he, he has created us out of love. This is another beautiful point that Aquinas makes, uh, really as a kind of, um, he says it with respect to creation, but it, it reaches its pinnacle in th speaking theologically. God has created us out of love. He has created us for himself. He has created us as creatures designed to know and love him. And more specifically, he has created you to know and love him. And he has a plan, he has a purpose for your life. And ultimately that purpose is to know and love him. But more concretely, each of us has to find the path to that ultimate end, which is going to vary for us because we are each different. So it is very important for us to examine not only what end we are aiming at, but also the means we are going to use to get there and how God is perhaps offering us particular means, particular opportunities, particular gifts that will correspond to who we are as individuals. And I think that's uh, a wonderfully rich point, and I will stop there with just a kind of recognition that um, uh, I think what St. Augustine said in his Confessions, uh, which Aquinas repeats and, and believes in very much, is, is profoundly true, uh, that we were made with a built-in desire for God, and he is what will make us ultimately happy, or as he says it so much more poetically, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O God. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, how would you resolve the tension, uh, if there is any, between the idea of natural law and natural order the scientific idea of the increasing entropy of the universe and the idea of concupiscence. Okay, that's a, uh, probably a very difficult question, so I'm going to do my best to um, improvise here and give, uh, I mean, I think there is um, a lot to be said there. Um, so maybe we could start with uh, entropy in uh, the universe and say, okay, do we see, do we see chaos and randomness in the universe? Is that actually the most characteristic uh, thing that we observe? And I think actually science uh, sees that there is a kind of order actually in the universe and where we see chaotic, uh, you know, that what seems to be chaos, actually the, the great advances in science come as we begin to recognize that within this there are patterns and in fact maybe a stable order standing behind it. So that uh, I think it's a certain presupposition of science that we can find principles of order and intelligibility in the universe around us. And that's precisely what we do in science. And the presupposition I think is profoundly true uh, that, okay, there is actually some intelligibility out there that our minds can know. It's not imposed by our minds on what is essentially random or unintelligible. We don't, we don't create the intelligibility, we discover it. And when we discover it, then we sort of marvel at the, the wonder of this intelligibility. And we even uh, will, you know, we can talk about how beautiful uh, it is. So I would suggest that there's already something very deep there and that that coheres very much with Aquinas' view that the universe is not just um, random chaos that has no meaning, but actually there's deep intelligibility there, and the whole project of contemporary science is based on, on that premise. 
OK, so as we begin to discover that order, uh, now this connects to natural law. What is natural law according to Aquinas? Natural law is, he says, this very um, interesting definition, our participation in God's eternal law. Now, you might say that's not illuminating at all to me. OK, so can you explain that? OK, what is, what is the eternal law? It is God's plan for the cosmos. So according to Aquinas, Aquinas' view, God is the source of all that is, and all that is emerges from him according to an ordered plan in his mind. So all the order that we discover in the cosmos actually originally is from God, and we, its intelligibility is there because it is from God, for the God who is uh, Logos. Okay, so this order is discoverable by the human mind, and that's precisely what we're doing in one one domain of research, which we call natural science. But we also want to engage in purposeful actions in our own lives. Okay, so what, what does all this have to do with, with what I'm saying? Well, Aquinas thinks of natural law uh, that it is the way we, with our minds, grasp the order that we find in the cosmos around us, which we recognize has come from God, and therefore we order our actions according to our place in that order. So whereas other beings, you know, cosmic dust does not consciously coalesce into planets. It doesn't think about it and choose to do it. But we are the kind of creatures that can understand what is our place in the cosmos, and we can intentionally put ourselves in that place. Or even better, we can, in the, in the whole trajectory of the cosmos, we can participate in it. We can even be provident for other people and help them find their place in it, or even, even animals and plants. And I mean, you can be a gardener and help the plants flourish, right? So, and that is the natural law. Uh, now, you asked a third thing, which may be about concupiscence. Yes, okay, so that's a big bug in the system, right? Um, so it seems like we should have desires that just fit into that order, but we don't. Why is that? We, we don't actually find this dramatic of a problem in other animals. Now, there are, uh, that could get complicated because we could talk about some apparent exceptions and we'd, we'd have to go into that. But the human animal seems to be much more prone to self-destructive behavior um, than a lot of other animals uh, or plants, that, that kind of thing. So Aquinas' answer is, well, that's because of the fall. That's because of sin that we have that problem. Uh, which doesn't afflict other other animals. Can you discuss the relationship between human curiosity and creativity and happiness? Oh yeah, that's a great one. So um, now, Father Brent spoke about the five inclinations, oh, yeah. and no, 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 that's that's all right because uh, it, this is easy to easy to miss. Um, so we have kind of basic inclinations given the kind of creatures we are, and you can kind of work your way up the ontological ladder, uh, which uh, Father Brent did, did but didn't um, maybe flag as clearly. So on the lowest level, like there's the desire to stay in being. You know, rocks have that desire, desire, right? Okay, it's, it's in a certain, a rock resists being broken apart. It takes a lot of work to do it. So in a certain sense, you could say a rock wants to stay uh, together and stay in being as a rock. Um, but then you, you move up and then you have like the desire to um, reproduce and other, lots of other animals have that inclination too. But when you move up to the top level of human inclinations, like to live in society, to have friendship, and to know the truth. And these are particular to the human being, unlike other creatures. And why? Precisely because we have intellects and wills. So we're capable of a kind of relation, relationality that other creatures don't have in true friendship and love. And we're capable of knowing the truth in a, at a higher level than other uh, animals. Now, by the way, just a footnote, Aquinas does not think that animals do not have any like knowledge or knowing. They don't have abstract or intellectual knowledge according to Aquinas, but he does have a whole theory of animal cognition, animal memory, animal emotion, kind of animal psychology. Uh, so that's 
often not perceived in Aquinas. What he thinks that is unique to us is our ability to know the truth abstractly, and that's a part of our nature because of our, uh, because of our constitution as human beings, as rational animals. Okay, so what does it have to do with curiosity? Well, that's precisely the desire to know as it plays out in our lives. And then you have a virtue connected with that. So if we want to reach our real end, we should order our knowing so that we, we proceed in a kind of ordered way, a rational way in acquiring knowledge. And Aquinas actually identifies a, a vice, which he, this, this is maybe just a play on words. He doesn't mean curiosity in the way that, that we mean it uh, the, or the way that your question presupposes. But he does identify a vice of curiositas, which is like the vice of the web surfer, you know, the, like the 2 a.m. web surfer, you know. This is curiositas, okay. If, if you have that vice, um, watch out, especially fatal for university students. Why? Because you think that you are acquiring knowledge, um, but actually you're just wasting your energy. Um, because you're acquiring useless knowledge that doesn't actually point you towards anything. And you're, you're not doing it in an ordered way. Like you're not integrating it into some larger activity. So Aquinas actually thinks we need to discipline our desire for knowledge because it can go astray. And he, it's not that he thinks that that knowledge is bad for us. He just thinks that it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a laziness of the intellectual creature to scatter itself in all kinds of kind of pointless inquiries instead of doing what, what our minds were made for. And so he wants you to like focus on what your mind is made for. So the next time you're thinking about like going one more time to that website at 2 a.m., you know, resist. We have time for one more question. Um, so when you were explaining uh, the Solon case, right, as I understand it, um, Aristotle's view there is that in order for one to be happy, one has to have a complete life of this, uh, a complete life that's in accordance with reason rather than just, you know, a moment in which one lives right. a virtuous existence. Um, so I take that to be sort of the middle position um, of, of the different, you know, how long do you, does one have to be living in accordance with virtue in order to be happy or to have a happy life? And then there's sort of the, uh, the other extreme as opposed to the sort of Thomistic one. The other extreme was just the sort of stoic position, right, where you just need to be living in accordance with virtue for a single instance, and you know, even if you were to die at that moment, then you would have lived a happy life. Um, and then I take it the the position that you know the Thomist is, or the one that you're staking out in the lecture, is that really in order to have a happy life, it has to be an infinite life, it has to last, you know, into into eternity. And so I'm just wondering, you know. How you would respond to the sort of Stoic and the Aristotelian? Because the Stoic will say, "Well, you're either living in accordance with virtue or not, and that's all there is to happiness. So it doesn't matter how long it lasts. It's just all about virtue." And the Aristotelian will say, "Well, it just has to be complete life, and something like infinity is just not what humans deal in. We deal in um, completion. Like you have your birth and you have your death, and did you do a good job in between? It's more or less like the other animals." Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that. I think um, it's probably a, a complicated answer. Maybe uh, some of our other speakers would also have something to add to it, but let me just uh, do my best, which is to say, I think um, on, uh, Aquinas acknowledges that there is a, a way to speak about a kind of uh, imperfect happiness or a happiness that is less, I mean, I don't mean imperfect in the sense that it's like um, there's something wrong with it, but just in terms of not in the fullest measure. And he thinks that the only perfect happiness in the end is going to be found in God. So uh, it's not to say that the other things are not happy or that living a virtuous life or living virtue for one moment is, um, is not right or something like that. But especially when you uh, look at how he approaches things from a natural perspective or within philosophy, and then when you add a supernatural dimension to it, so he certainly thinks that the ultimate end is a supernatural end, like the true end of human beings is like the supernatural end, but it's not knowable by reason, and it needs, you need grace to even know about it and also to get there. Um, so we can speak intelligibly just 
about within the frame, with, you might say within the natural frame or the this worldly frame. And there are those other uh, cases like, you know, an Aristotelian position or a Stoic position, they gain a lot more traction once you say, well, uh, okay, we, we just have to bracket this question or maybe even say we shouldn't even talk about it or, or pretend we don't know about the possibility of life after death or eternity with God. And really, we just have to be focused on what are you going to get in this life? And okay, if you, if you put it into those terms, then I think you could engage in that, that kind of uh, dialectic over you know, how, whether you want a basket of goods or is there still some all-encompassing aim. And people uh, interpreted Aristotle disagree very much about what he thinks about that. So you have some philosophers who read Aristotle in one way and others who read him in another way. Um, Aquinas, I think, in the end would say, uh, well, you know, the, the supernatural aim relativizes all of those uh, time-bound ones and puts them in a perspective that divine revelation gives you um, that uh, that's in a way why we need divine revelation because it's pretty hard to figure it out if you just stay within the frame of this world. And it's the only one that's really going to fully satisfy your, your desire especially when that desire is awakened. Um, if I can just make one final point, and this is just for those theologians in the room who might have like pressing questions about 20th century and 21st century theology, um, probably as a very small minority of you, but uh, uh, there was a very big controversy in the 20th century over the natural desire to see God. Henri de Lubac famously uh, disagreed with some standard Thomistic interpreters uh, in the 20th century, arguing that their is a natural desire that is before supernatural grace to say see God directly or have the beatific vision, basically to, to get to the life of heaven. And uh, I would I, I think that is not I think that is clearly not Aquinas's view. So he thinks that there is a kind of naturally intelligible desire for a finite happiness, but once you are awakened to the possibility of a perfect happiness, which is supernatural, then you see that that finite happiness is very relative, and now it will, it will not satisfy you. Like now you, you actually will want to go all the way to the top, uh, as it were. Um, if I can just use one other analogy for understanding this, um, it's a sci-fi, you know, space analogy, which I, I like those kinds of analogies, um, uh, because I've always been fascinated by like the Apollo program and going to the moon and things like that. Okay, so if, if you, uh, you, we could imagine having a kind of sci-fi desire to like fly to the center of the sun, um, but uh, you know, wouldn't there be some physical problems with that? Yes, okay, you know, this, uh, it's um, hard to build a spacecraft that would get there, and then probably the, the heat would kill you and would destroy the spacecraft before it ever got there, and then there's the radiation and the pressure and like you're in the center of this um, fusion reaction in the center of a star, okay, it's just not going to work, right? We're not going to be able to build a spacecraft that will take a human being to the center of the sun. It's just not possible for us. But it's still imaginable to us that we would like have a kind of sci-fi um, fantasy about this, like, oh, I wish somehow it were possible. But you see, no one actually orders a life around that, unless they're insane. Like maybe a crazy person would try to build a spacecraft in his backyard to go to the center of the moon, but like no one does that. And Aquinas thinks that in a certain way, the desire for seeing God is like that without revelation. So without revelation, you would never imagine that you could share in the divine nature and be friends with God and that he would give you a share in his eternal life and peace and uh, love. But this has been revealed to us as possible. And once we realize that it's possible, of course, we really want it, and we reorder our lives around it. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, as living in a kind of Christian culture, or maybe post-Christian Christian culture, that idea is so deeply suffused in our, in our culture, like the possibility of some kind of heaven, that people assume that it's kind of naturally accessible to us, but Aquinas' view was it is not naturally accessible, and it's only like in it's only because we've sort of absorbed it through kind of uh, cultural osmosis in a Christian or post-Christian culture that we can even talk about it, and that's only because it was divinely revealed a long time ago. But an excellent question, thank you.